A little while ago, I played The Case of the Golden Idol, a short, innovative mystery game from Latvian indie developer Color Grey Games that came out in October of 2022, and actually just released a prequel DLC called The Spider of Lanka. Considered by some, including perhaps the developers themselves, to be a spiritual successor to Return of the Oberdin, Case of the Golden Idol trades in the same 18th century intrigue, freeze-frame murder victims, and grammatical crime solving. It took me about four hours from start to finish to complete the game, and I did play in one sitting, which I think I would recommend, but it would definitely not be a problem to play across multiple sessions. I think the story and the gameplay are both pretty successful, and I want to talk about how and why they work. But first, given the nature of mystery games, it's almost impossible to talk about Case of the Golden Idol without spoiling some details you may prefer to discover for yourself. I went into this one completely blind, and if that's the experience you prefer, you might want to click away from this video before I say any more. However, I will give another spoiler warning in a bit before I talk about specific details from a few of the cases, so if you're curious what this game is all about, you can always jump ship then. The case of the Golden Idol spends a 50-year period from 1742 to 1795, presenting a series of increasingly complex cases that feel, at first, only loosely connected, but ultimately tell a larger story about exotic expeditions and treasure, gentlemen thieves and political intrigue, cult rituals and esoteric prophecies, blackmail, dinner parties, and the family squabbles of the Cloudsleys, a nouveau riche noble house whose recent inheritance involves a mysterious golden idol that Henry Jones Jr. would probably prefer be kept behind a solid glass barrier. That belongs in a museum! The game consists of four chapters, each of which contains three scenes, for a grand total of 11 regular cases and one epilogue. Each scene depicts, with a few frames of animation, a single moment in time, always set in the aftermath of a suspicious death. You yourself do not play as a character, nor do your investigations have any effect on the story or any in-game reason to be happening. You are an all-seeing eye, an omniscient presence existing outside the story with the ability to float between rooms, examine the contents of pockets and books and drawers, and hear the last thoughts and words uttered by anyone present in the scene. In case of the Golden Idol, you toggle between two modes, exploration, which is basically a point-and-click investigation of a crime scene frozen in time, and thinking, which opens a menu of fill-in-the-blank sentences a la Detective Grimoire or Return of the Obra Dinn, which the creators of Golden Idol have cited as a direct influence. At the bottom of the screen is a word bank, which is populated whenever you click on new names, places, weapons, and underscored words in explore mode, and drawn from as you fill in the scrolls of thinking mode. Some of the words like knife, dagger, small sword, or stiletto might be red herrings, and the later cases contain significantly more words to sort through. I really enjoyed the case of the Golden Idol, and I wanted to talk about two particular mechanical aspects that stood out to me, but it's impossible to do that without diving into the details of the game, so consider this your final warning. From this point on, I'm going to talk about some specific details from a few of the cases, especially the dinner party case, which is the fifth of the twelve. I won't spoil the major solutions, but I will be talking about some story details, plus discussing puzzles and minor answers from the first half of the game, so proceed at your own risk. I don't personally feel any of these details would ultimately ruin your experience, but if you do, and this game sounds up your alley, by all means go play it and come back later. And with that said, let's take a look. Part 1. Who Owns the Zebra? Despite the fact that detective and mystery games are commonly associated with logic and deductive reasoning, real-life detective work rarely, if ever, resembles a classic logic puzzle. Typically, detectives gather evidence and testimony and construct a cumulative case against a suspect based on empirical data, not pure reasoning. Some games follow this more grounded approach, but games like Case of the Golden Idol or Return of the Oprah Din are proudly inspired by big, grandiose logic puzzles. One way to talk about this difference in approach is to talk about the difference between positive evidence and negative evidence. Positive evidence is evidence that establishes a connection between two details of the case. So, for example, fingerprints left at the crime scene, letters of blackmail found on the victim, or a bloody knife found in the murderer's apartment are all positive evidence because they connect the criminal to the crime. Negative evidence, on the other hand, is evidence that exculpates a particular suspect or disproves a particular possibility, but can never point to the true culprit by itself. An alibi, for instance, is negative evidence that, if confirmed, disproves a suspect's involvement in the crime. Most video games use positive evidence to point the player in the right direction. For instance, in The Witcher 3, you can investigate a case of arson by examining the scene and then following a set of footprints to the arsonist. This is realistic, I guess, especially for a monster hunter with super senses, but it doesn't require much deductive reasoning. In some instances, Case of the Golden Idol uses positive evidence to connect elements of a case, but the best parts of the game flip the script and have you solve a complicated crime by instead using negative evidence to eliminate incorrect suspects from a finite set. This kind of inference is inherently more logical in nature, and depends on establishing, as I just mentioned, a finite set of possibilities. 
Perhaps the most famous example of this type of logic puzzle is the so-called zebra puzzle, sometimes called Einstein's riddle, even though Einstein almost certainly didn't come up with it. Either way, you've probably heard some version of this riddle. The premise is that there are five differently colored houses in a row, each containing an occupant of a distinct nationality who has a unique choice of beverage, a unique pet, and smokes a unique brand of cigarettes. The ultimate objective of the puzzle is to determine who owns the zebra, hence the name, and you're given a list of clues like the Norwegian lives next to the blue house, the Ukrainian drinks tea, or the man who smokes Chesterfields lives in the house next to the man with the fox. The charm, or perhaps the frustration, of this puzzle is that the only way to answer who owns the zebra is to literally assign every last detail of the riddle. So what at first appears to be a simple question actually pulls you into a very complicated puzzle that will almost certainly require a pen and paper to work out. In fact, logic puzzles like the zebra puzzle are often represented by a matrix like this one, which lets you rule out impossibilities and arrive at correct solutions through process of elimination. If this grid reminds you of a Sudoku puzzle, that's because they essentially function the same way. Now, importantly, this kind of logic puzzle absolutely depends on there being a finite set of options, i.e. only five pets, only five beverages, and so on. If I told you there were actually 10 or more houses and an unknown number of possible pets, it would completely break the puzzle. I bring this up because in order to apply this type of reasoning, you first have to establish a finite set of options. To bring it back to murder mysteries, this is basically how the classic board game Clue works. There are six suspects, six murder weapons, and nine rooms in Clue, and the way you identify the correct solution is by ruling out the incorrect options. You can't examine forensic evidence linking the candlestick to Mr. Body's corpse, so the only way to establish that the candlestick is the murder weapon is to eliminate the wrench, the knife, the revolver, the rope, and the lead pipe from contention. Which means, to solve the main mystery, you'll have to investigate five other mysteries. I think this is a big reason the structure works in games like Return of the Obra Dinn or Case of the Golden Idol, because the more you investigate the mystery, the bigger and more complex it all starts to seem, until eventually you're able to wrap your mind around the whole thing. Return of the Obra Dinn presents quite a few similar logic puzzles. For instance, when you find a lightning-struck figure among the ship's rigging, you can identify the victim as part of the set Top Men, which consists of 10 members according to the ship's manifest, meaning one way to identify him is by assigning the identities of all the other Top Men. Similarly, there are only four women aboard the Obra Dinn, so if you assign three identities, the fourth woman can then be identified by process of elimination. Essentially, this means these games can set up elaborate logic puzzles with no direct positive evidence linking the main mystery to its solution. This kind of inference by elimination is rare in real life, because finite knowable sets are mostly an abstraction of pure logic. If you suspect six people of a crime in real life, and rule out five of them, you don't get to conclude that the sixth suspect is the culprit, because you can't rule out the possibility of a seventh unknown individual. In other words, real life isn't Clue, or the zebra puzzle, but that's why it's fun to play games like Case of the Golden Idol, where everything fits together and logic reigns supreme. Case of the Golden Idol makes frequent use of the logic grid deduction by elimination setup, appearing first in the third case, where you have to examine burnt scraps of a will and determine who inherited the Golden Idol by assigning the other bequests to the set of those present at the will reading. My favorite use of the structure occurs in the fifth case, the intoxicating dinner party, which actually pairs two separate logic puzzles and asks you to synthesize a solution. The first, as you might suspect, is a dinner party murder mystery. One of the guests at Edmund Cloudsley's dinner party has dropped dead of poisoning, and it's your job to determine who she is, why she was poisoned, and most importantly, where she was sitting. In real life, that third detail would be trivial, but in the game, the player is trapped in a freeze frame moments after the poisoning, in which the guests are all gathered around the victim's corpse on the sofa. In order to determine which beverage was poisoned, and therefore how the killer might have pulled it off, you have to deduce where the murder victim sat. But once again, there is no positive evidence linking the victim to her table setting. The only way to correctly deduce her place at the table is to assign every seat to its matching guest. But even here, there's no concrete answers to discover. Instead, you uncover details like guest A is a vegetarian, guest B is a teetotaler, or guest X and Y sat next to each other. These are logical clues, like those in the zebra puzzle, and it's your job to make sense of the big picture and fit them all together. Solving the seating chart immediately leads to another mystery in the other wing of the house, which is also solved by eliminating options from a finite set, in this case the bedrooms in the servants' quarter. Upon inspection, one room contains a copy of a key to the liquor cabinet that held the poisoned libation, indicating that this is the room of the killer. However, once again, there is no positive evidence linking the killer to their room, so the only way to identify the bedroom's occupant is to assign all the rooms to their inhabitants. Again, this involves untying a giant knot of complex logical interactions. A single 
single mystery quickly explodes into 10 mysteries, as the need to eliminate candidates from a set pulls you into tangential investigations and mini-mysteries. It also means that the overall case can be approached from many different starting points, which critically provides the player with a lot of agency, and avoids the feeling that the game is spoon-feeding the mystery to you one clue at a time. In fact, you could just as easily tackle the servants' rooms before the seating chart, and your experience of this case would be completely backwards, but still absolutely work. Speaking of backwards, another aspect of this case that's worth noting is the completely backwards setup of the mystery. The two things you're investigating, who lives in which room and which dinner guest sat where, would be completely trivial details if this were a real investigation, whereas the copied key, the poison, and a note describing the killer's motive would be very difficult to discover. From a gameplay perspective, it doesn't really matter, but it's a very peculiar approach and part of Golden Idol's unique charm. Part 2. The Curious Incident of Little Pip and the Pilfered Brandy Stepping out of the realm of pure logic, I want to talk about how Case of the Golden Idol presents the clues you have to apply to the big logic puzzles of the game. Because unlike the zebra puzzle, it's not like there's a big list of rules on screen that govern the case. You actually have to investigate and discover the rules for yourself, and some of the ways you go about that are pretty interesting. For instance, instead of the game outright stating that two characters sat next to each other at the dinner table, you can discover a note from one guest in the pocket of the butler, offering to slip the butler a shilling if he sat next to an eligible bachelorette, and a single shilling indicating that the transaction did indeed take place. From these details, it's your job to infer that the pair, in fact, sat next to one another. This rule is a one-off clue, but sometimes mysteries revolve around larger rules that govern bigger chunks of the game world, like the quantum mechanics in Outer Wilds, or the myriad puzzle rules in The Witness, and often games introduce these rules by using a test case. A very simple scenario whose sole function is to illustrate the new rule at work. Part of the fun of a mystery is deducing rules, and then applying them to the world. And the first step in many mystery games is dissecting a test case, and arming yourself with new information that unlocks future problems. For instance, by identifying a few stewards in Return of the Obra Dinn, you can deduce the rule that stewards wear this uniform, then use that rule to identify other stewards in future memories. Even way outside the context of mysteries, writers will sometimes use test cases to play fair with audiences, and establish rules that will become important later. Why is Nagini the snake a horcrux in Harry Potter? To establish the rule that sentient beings can be horcruxes, which in turn gives the reader a fair shot at guessing that Harry might also be a horcrux. Writers across genres use test cases to establish rules, although mystery games by nature are much less generous with spelling out the rule. Once you have inferred a new rule, you can wield that rule in future situations to make headway with the case, and there are certainly a lot of rules to discover in Case of the Golden Idol. There are rules about alchemy and cult rituals and criminal sentencing, secret codes and pseudonyms and servant seniority. One rule that appears in Golden Idol's dinner party mystery is that keys, which are found in the pockets and living quarters of the service staff, can be matched to their respective locks by their distinctive designs. This is important because a key, no pun intended, element of the mystery, is establishing which suspect had access to the poisoned refreshment. So servants in possession of the heart-shaped key had access to the cabinet secured by the heart-shaped lock, and so on for the pentagonal and square-shaped keys. This could probably be reasonably assumed, but it's demonstrated by the fact that servants with access to particular liquor cabinets will have some of its contents either in their room or on their person. If you know which beverages the poison victim consumed, this can narrow down the list of suspects, but is still insufficient to deduce the culprit, because the game takes the key mystery a step further, which means that now I have to talk about one of my favorite moments in the game. One of the first characters you encounter at the dinner party is Little Pip, a sticky-fingered servant boy whose room contains a collection of purloined objects and curiosities. One such curiosity is a strange clay key that lacks the distinctive designs of the other keys, and another is a small bottle of brandy from a locked cabinet. The implication is that Pip stole this bottle of brandy using his ersatz key, and a comparison of this key to the authentic brandy cabinet key shows that the teeth of the keys are identical. Pip's copied key and stolen brandy, it turns out, have nothing to do with the case at hand, but they still fulfill a very important function. They prove the rule that copied keys can be used to access the same cabinets as regular keys, and that they can be matched to their intended locks by comparing the teeth of the copied key to its authentic counterpart, something you can easily do as an all-seeing eye. This is critical, because the killer's room contains another copied key, but no contraband linking this key to a particular cabinet. Little Pip's pilfered brandy is the test case that allows players to prove which cabinet the killer had access to, or if you solved the case in the opposite order, to prove that the owner of this key, not Pip, is in fact the killer. So all told, in order to solve this mystery you have to understand how the keys to the liquor cabinets work. 
the principle behind copied keys, the occupants of the rooms containing copied keys, and the table setting of the murder victim, in order to match the poisoned libation to the suspect who had access to it. And each step of the way, you have to deduce and apply unique rules to narrow down the possibilities. I can imagine a much weaker mystery game, where you might simply examine the crucial liquor cabinet and get some text like, Hey look, Ash from the Butler's Cigar, i.e. the butler did it, case closed. In case of the Golden Idol, you really have to understand how the pieces fit together to solve the mystery. I won't spoil the rest of the game, but something I like about Case of the Golden Idol is that each scenario has new, clever rules to discover, and before you can even begin to solve the case at hand, you have to wrap your mind around those rules. And the rules in the game stay pretty fresh and varied, so there's always a new type of rule to recognize. Later in the game there's a very mathy case that requires you to internalize very specific rules about values, and a case involving fictitious plants with neurological effects, which you have to understand in order to diagnose an individual, assess the plant that drugged him, and trace the suspect who had access to said plant. Plant. It's an approach that rewards a genuine understanding of the events unfolding and really draws you into the game world. So there you go, two elements that I found interesting in Case of the Golden Idol. This is a really unique game, and I hope more people get the chance to play it. If you've played this game, try not to spoil any solutions, but let me know your favorite realization in the comments. How did you feel about the big logic puzzles, and how long did it take you to cotton on to the main twist? What was your favorite case? If you haven't played this game and you like mysteries, or just unique gameplay experiences, go check this one out, and don't forget to check out the new DLC that just released. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe, and come back for the next one, because there's gonna be more videos like this one. Thanks a ton for watching, and see you next time.